You're listening to the N2K Space Network. And now, a word from our sponsor, SpyCloud, the cybercrime analytics leader. SpyCloud disrupts cybercrime by telling you what criminals know about your business and your customers, so you can take action to prevent ransomware, session hijacking, account takeover, and online fraud. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data from the criminal underground, including credentials, session cookies, and PII siphoned from malware-infected devices. With knowledge of the specific exposed data criminals have in hand from InfoStealer malware on managed and unmanaged devices, security teams can respond with a more efficient and effective process called post-infection remediation that fits seamlessly into existing incident response frameworks. Get SpyCloud's post-infection remediation guide outlining the seven steps for preventing a malware infection from becoming a full-blown ransomware incident. Visit spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. And we thank SpyCloud for sponsoring our show. Quarterly reporting of financial information creates a more level playing field for access to financial details between insiders and outside investors. In recent years, commercial space companies haven't painted a pretty picture. As we've been saying for the last few weeks, the outlook is starting to look positive, and the word stabilization seems to keep cropping up. T minus 20 seconds to LOS, Pedro. Today is August the 9th, 2023. I'm Alice Carruth, and this is T-Minus. Rocket Lab stock source, Firefly Aerospace and Zenti to conduct a responsive space demonstration for the NRO. Artemis 2 crew visit the Orion capsule. And today we have the second part of Maria's chat with Kaylin Trikin and Steve Bajenski from the Aerospace Village on the nonprofit's mission, their programs, and the upcoming DEF CON Hacker Convention. On to today's report. We've been discussing the results of the last financial quarter a lot recently, and tomorrow we'll be speaking with Space Capital Managing Partner Chad Anderson to wrap up findings from the start of this year. But today, we're focusing on Rocket Lab's latest news. We knew after the successful launches that this company had notched up both in the US and New Zealand this year that the results were going to be good, and they didn't disappoint. There were losses, but revenue grew 12% year over year in the second quarter. They also announced 10 new contracts for 2023 and 2024. Rocket Lab founder and CEO Peter Beck said, The second quarter saw a strong performance across Rocket Lab's launch and space system businesses, with three successful electron launches, more than 17 spacecraft featuring Rocket Lab satellite components deployed to orbit, and multiple new launch contracts signed with new and returning customers. Rocket Lab expects revenue to grow between $73 million and $77 million for the third quarter of this year. The company also touted progress with its Neutron rocket, with a test campaign on the Archimedes engine already underway. We're expecting big things from Rocket Lab in the next 12 months to include the first flight campaign of the Neutron in 2024. On yesterday's show, we discussed Firefly Aerospace's new fleet of on-orbit vehicles, and it seems that they've already secured their first customer. Firefly has announced a new partnership with Zenti to conduct a responsive space demonstration for the National Reconnaissance Office in 2024. A Firefly Alpha rocket will launch the company's new Elytra spacecraft with Zenti's Phantom Ride small satellite dispenser on board. Zenti plans to demonstrate the ability to add, replace or remove payloads on Phantom Ride within hours of the launch without impacting the loads on the booster. 
The Artemis II crew got their first look at the Lockheed Martin-built Orion capsule that will carry them around the moon next year. The four astronauts said that seeing the hardware firsthand and meeting the men and women building the vehicle brought home the reality of their historic mission. The Artemis II crew are not expected to launch before November of next year, and NASA says the mission remains on track. The space agency did warn that a lot of work remains for both the Artemis II and three missions to return humans to the moon. There's also ongoing concerns with whether or not SpaceX's Starship will be ready for Artemis III's launch in 2025. Lockheed Martin and the Space Development Agency have successfully completed a critical design review for the Tranche 1 transport layer program known as T1TL. The integrated system review validated that Lockheed Martin's T1TL ground and space designs meet all mission requirements and can proceed to production. Our friends at Starfish Space have received a tactical funding increase of 1.8 million US dollars by the US Air Force. The new award by AFWorks will support continued development of the company's cephalopod software for satellite guidance, navigation and control. The award builds on previous collaborations between Starfish and the Air Force Research Lab. Space services company Spire has been awarded a contract by GHG Sat to build, launch and operate four additional 16 new satellites that will carry GHG Sat payloads to monitor greenhouse gas emissions. This new contract builds upon Spire's initial agreement with GHG Sat for three 16 new satellites that were launched by the end of this year. GHG Sat had an early focus on oil and gas, but has since increased data observed from other emission industries. The company stated that the contract demonstrates GHG Sat's continuing and growing commitment to the UK and is directly related to a recently announced initiative by the UK Space Agency, Satellite Applications Catapult and GHG Sat to accelerate climate innovation. We led with the story on Monday that KKR had invested in OHM and suggested that that investment would extend to OHM's rocket factory, and indeed it has. KKR is now a majority stakeholder at launch service provider Rocket Factory Augsburg, known as RFA. RFA announced that they raised €30 million investment from KKR, which they intend to use for developments ahead of their first stage test at Scotland's Saxaford Spaceport planned for next year. Space situational awareness is a growing concern and a new partnership between Endurosat and Vioma is offering a solution. The companies say that they're working together on Europe's first commercial mission for in-situ space situational awareness. Bioma brings to the partnership in-orbit optical telescopes to observe space objects and map the orbital environment at a high frequency. Endurosat will design and build microsatellites which will be deployed in a low Earth orbit. The spacecraft is also equipped with edge computing capabilities for in-orbit processing of the images in real time and data reduction. The companies plan to launch the first two pilot satellites by the end of next year as part of a 12-satellite constellation. The United Arab Emirates have said that they plan to send astronauts to space every three to five years. The Director General of Mohammed bin Rashid Space Centre told the Emirates news agency that the country now has four qualified astronauts. Two Emiratis have already spent time on the International Space Station. The UAE is working with neighbours Bahrain and Kuwait on space programmes and is discussing developing satellites and training with Egypt and Saudi Arabia. China held a launch earlier today to lift an HJ206 Earth observation satellite to orbit. The satellite has two image modes. 5 meter spatial resolution and 25 meter spatial resolution will be used for monitoring disasters and providing data support for emergency management, ecological environment, natural resources and other industries. The mission marked the 482nd flight of China's Long March carrier rockets. That concludes our briefing for today. You can find links to all the stories we have covered in our show notes, and we've included a story covering a report on China's rapid space launch advantage. You can find them all at space.n2k.com. Hey, T-Crew, if you find this podcast useful, 
please do us a favor and share a five-star rating and a short review in your favorite podcast app. It will help other space professionals like you find the show and join the T-Minus crew. Thank you. We really appreciate it. And now a word from our sponsor, Six Sense. Six Sense provides award-winning cloud-based automated endpoint and vulnerability management solutions to streamline IT and security operations. With its advanced platform, businesses gain complete visibility and control over their infrastructure, reducing IT and security risks and optimizing operational efficiency. With Six Sense, you'll get real-time alerts, risk-based vulnerability prioritization and remediations, and an intuitive automation and orchestration engine so you can focus on your core business goals, confident in the knowledge that your enterprise is secure, compliant, and running smoothly. Visit SixSense.com to learn why enterprises choose them. Today, we have the second installment of Maria's interview with Kaylin Triken and Steve Luchensky from the Aerospace Village on the nonprofit's mission, their programs, and the upcoming DEF CON Hacker Convention. To pile on to what Kaylin said, you know, that, that government side, the growth we've seen over these five years, um, we've got a person from TSA coming in to talk about uh, the screening systems and the cybersecurity involved with that. We've got uh, two nice ladies from the Office of the National Cyber Director, and they're coming in to talk about things from National Cybersecurity Strategy and the Workforce Strategy that's recently published. But they also do work with the National Space Council. So their perspective from that high-level government side of things all the way down to the deep technical and, and things like what Kaylin's mentioned on both space and aviation I'm excited. I get to do a talk with the TSA administrator, hearing his perspective on both space and uh, av- aviation and space related cybersecurity concerns, the industrial control systems at airports, spaceports, all of that, and what you know, folks are probably hearing more and more about what TSA is doing. So, uh, and then I'll, I had to put in a plug also, Kaylin mentioned Pete's talk, but he's also hosting and moderating a panel of a five year retrospective. So, Pete, for those who don't know, he's one of the original co-founders. Others on that panel, Bo Woods, Alex Romero, uh, Katie Noble, and I think Randy Talley, who's currently at TSA, will be joining uh, because they lived the early on trials and tribulations and what they had to do to make sure, like Kaylin said, we do this and a trusting relationship building environment uh, to grow, to have the success and get where we are today and and uh, what our volunteers are putting on. But So in addition to the talks, the things people can come and do, like we mentioned, you've got talks that are very technical and very high level. Uh, We have activities that are very deeply technical and very complex on the run side of things. And we've also got activities that are very simple and straightforward uh, in like a crawl, walk, run mentality. So Capture the Flag events being hosted by Boeing, by Lockheed Martin, the Aviation ISAC, has brought in students from Embry-Riddle. We've got students in our talk track. We've got students running these Capture the Flags. Uh, We have other smaller companies uh, like CT Cube, Intelligenesis, uh, showing some of their training systems, some of the industrial control systems as it relates to runway lighting and the security behind those and how they demonstrate that. SpaceX is going to have one of their ground stations there. Uh, It sounds like they're going to have a spacesuit and an engine. So it's just good to have some cool things to look at uh, we'll have an Airbus cockpit, uh, one of our, uh, again, another partner of ours, Pentest Partners. They have built an Airbus cockpit, and they use that to demonstrate. I'm sorry, a cockpit. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And, and yes, it will be there for fun, the fun of flying it also. So, uh, But demonstrating <laughs> electronic alone, flight right? bag. And, exactly. <laughs> and, and they're going to have actual aircraft seats. So we're going to have, uh, you can, your experience of flying out there, being uncomfortable and flying home, you can do that in our village. Uh, so we have all of that. And then, like Kaylin said, we've got our badges that we take donations for. That helps us keep going. Um, and one other event I, I forgot I've been working on this lately is an Ask Me Anything. Yeah, yeah. Tell me about that. 
uh, we're, we've got all these experts, right? We've got experts that are our volunteers, that our volunteers are pilots, former pilots, military, commercial, all the way to people who've done policy and government, policy and industry, the security researchers who are, they've been doing it their entire career. And then we have all these partners and experts that are coming in, either speaking or the activities that we talked about. And so folks want to learn from them. And so uh, we have it on our website. It'll be probably expect about 12 to four o'clock on Friday and on Saturday, nothing on Sunday for this portion, but where you can sit down and say, hey, I want to learn about getting into cybersecurity. I want to learn about getting into cybersecurity in aviation or space sector. And you can hear from folks. If they want to talk about where they work. If you want to know about it, great. But the idea is experienced people who come from a government, an industry, an academic, a security researcher background. You can ask them any questions that you want. You can hear more about what they did, how they got in, the goods, the bads, all of those things. So it's it's so good to see the the bringing that expertise together. And, and this is something we've been looking forward to. And our, our uh, partners at uh, AIAA, it's the American Institute of Aeronautics Astronautics, are hosting that for us. And we really appreciate their effort there. All these marquee names that you've been mentioning, that's just incredible that in five years, you've got all that fantastic partnership and all these amazing organizations coming in to support the mission. That is so wonderful and encouraging to hear. I have to ask the obligatory trend question. What have you noticed over these last five years? I mean, it sounds like almost exponential growth if one can map such a thing. So I think, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we started as the Aviation Village year one. And then after that expanded to the Aerospace Village. And that was actually when um, Hackasat kind of kicked off and started with us. And we were bringing in the idea of the, the CTF, working with the U.S. Air Force, and now U.S. Air Force and Space Force and AFRL. And it was kind of one of these catalyst moments where, you know, when you're working on something this big that I think many thought, wow, I can't believe this is going to happen. And we're going to do this here at a place like DEF CON. And we're going to see that type of collaboration and community across government, industry, and, and nonprofit. And It was this huge undertaking. And then, you know, we pulled it off during COVID, which was unexpected as well. And I think that COVID really, you know, being so online and being able to try to like make this hard pivot and really, really figure out how are we going to engage with folks that want to participate in this competition, want to learn about aerospace security. I think it allowed us to foster a ton of growth. I think, you know, it's an interesting COVID, as unfortunate as it was, and we obviously wanted to be together, I think it did give us that opportunity to just have such a farther reach than we would have had just focusing on one event um, that isn't accessible to everybody. Not everybody can travel to Las Vegas in in August, Um, though I I envy those people because 120 (laughs) degree heat is something I'm not looking forward to. Um, It could rain. You never know. (laughs) Fingers crossed for that. It could. (laughs) It could. (laughs) you know, continuing to operate, you know, throughout the year and the years after fostering the community, engaging and not having it be a once a year engagement has really, is really why we've grown so much. A lot of the work that the villages and Steve has done to put us into places like RSA, like Hack the Capital to ensure that we are, you know, testing out different communities, reaching different communities, engaging and talking. That's where I think the growth has come from. And we've seen Hackasat evolve too throughout this time. And that brings me, that brings us to what I'm going to call the satellite in the room here, which is we haven't talked about it in depth yet. But um, this year, Hackasat finals are going to happen at DEF CON on a satellite that is in space, Moonlighter. Um, so cool. It is orbiting so in space. Neat. It is. So cool. I'm such a nerd. I have, have um, volunteered to be launched in, into space with the next one just because that's on my bucket list. I'm so excited to bring Hackasat to in, in this competition. I'm working with the Air Force and the Space Force to to actually do this and have it be live in space with these finalist teams. I think it's just going to be something that is incredible. It's such a testament to all of the work that the community, that the village has done And I think, you know, it helps to make sure that our reach is happening. You know, these, this CTF is a huge deal and, 
uh, you know, we're, comp- we're, we're up against the uh, AI wars this year. So we'll take what we can get to, to keep, uh, keep ourselves in the conversation. Well, and the beauty is Hackasack covers both the activity side, like what Kayla mentioned, it's happening. It's happening at DEF CON. It's on the other side of the wall. So we're paired up like we've always been paired up together. So if somebody comes into the village, they walk through the village. And on the other side, they're going to see the Hackasat teams doing what they do and to capture the flag. Uh, if they stay each day, we're going to, the Hackasat team is going to do an update in the morning. I believe it's our first talk each day uh, where they're going to spend time on stage talking about what went on with the day prior, the overnight, uh, because the teams are going the entire time. So uh, so both on the speaking side and come see it live in action side. We're going to have a CubeSat. I failed to mention. I knew I'd forget some folks. Our friends at Cal Poly, the CubeSat, known as the Project Moonlighter that Kaylin mentioned, is a CubeSat launched in June, deployed off the uh, ISS uh, in uh, July. That's what's orbiting. That's what they're hacking on for this capture of the flag. Well, we have one because Cal Poly is bringing one in and uh, you can talk to folks about how it works and, and what it does. So again, it's just that variety of things uh, building on the success of what's grown now in the fourth year of Hackasat. DEF CON is such an amazing, overwhelming event, uh, especially for someone who might be new. So um, I'm just going to close with like a, a newbie question. If someone's going to DEF CON for the first time and they want to go to the village, your village, what would you recommend they start with first? I know it depends on what they're interested in, but let's just <laughs> just go with that. <laughs> I would say I, I, it wasn't too, too long ago that I was a newbie DEF CON, DEF CONer. And I, I would say, you know, if you're entering the aerospace village, look for someone in a blue aerospace village t-shirt and just go up to them and, and ask them, you know, share what your interests are. And we will help make sure that you have the best first experience that you can have. You know, we have so many incredible volunteers with such incredible backgrounds. And and we want, you know, we want people to have a great experience and to take something away and to learn something that they didn't know when they entered the village. So look for somebody in an Aerospace Village t-shirt. That is my advice. And And I think what you led off with, Maria, is... Having tried to do everything at DEF CON because there's so many villages, so many activities, so many talks, you got to stand in line or you're going to miss out on the talk. Just pick something. Maybe it's our village for the entire day. We would love to have you. Just like Kaylin said, talk to somebody in a blue shirt or one of the nice neon vests that we're bringing this year so you know who the volunteers are and they can point you in the right direction. Uh, But really, that focus. So you can actually enjoy DEF CON as opposed to just get totally whooped uh, trying to do everything because we're only one small portion of DEF CON, right? The, the building that we're in, as massive as it is, there's still things over in the Link and over in the Flamingo and the other hotels. Um, so yeah, just being able to make your way around and calmly enjoy and spend time in each place is the recommendation I'd offer. That's some, some earned wisdom there indeed. I don't follow it myself, but I offer it and I try to get, I try to do it, but I I fail. It's, it's a lot. It's a big event. Kaylin and Steve, I wish you all the best at DEF CON this year. We'll be right back. Now, a word from our sponsor, the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute, currently seeking qualified applicants for its innovative Master of Science in Security Informatics degree program. Study alongside world-class interdisciplinary experts and gain unparalleled educational, research, and professional experience in information security and assurance. Interested U.S. citizens should consider the National Science Foundation's CyberCorps Scholarship for Service program, which covers tuition and a $6,000 annual professional development allowance, as well as providing a $37,000 additional annual stipend. Apply for the scholarship and the fall semester by March 1st. Learn more at cs.jhu.edu slash mssi. And 
welcome back. Admiral James T. Kirk is going to be inducted into the San Diego Air and Space Museum's Hall of Fame. OK, not the character Captain Kirk, but the actor that's best known for playing him. William Shatner is also the oldest person to have travelled to space, having taken a trip with Blue Origin at the age of 90 in 2021. The museum's CEO says the actor is being recognised for his contribution in sparking public interest in the cosmos. The Shat joins renowned figures such as Buzz Aldrin, Chuck Yeager and Sally Ride as an inductee. Good on you, Captain. That's it for T-minus for August the 9th, 2023. For additional resources from today's report, check out our show notes at space.ntk.com. We'd love to know what you think of this podcast. You can email us at space at n2k.com or submit the survey in the show notes. Your feedback ensures we deliver the information that keeps you a step ahead of the rapidly changing space industry. N2K Strategic Workforce Intelligence optimizes the value of your biggest investment, your people. We make you smarter about your team while making your team smarter. This episode was mixed by Elliot Peltzman and Trey Hester with original music and sound design by Elliot Peltzman. Our executive producer is Brandon Calf. Our chief intelligence officer is Eric Tillman and I'm Alice Carruth. Thanks for listening. Listening.